And uh, good morning. This is Mike Galeazzo from the Regional Manufacturing Institute. And I want to thank everybody for joining us this morning for what should be a very, very productive uh, discussion about how to keep uh, keep your your op, your um, facilities open during this period of COVID and protect against COVID. Um, but let me just mention the, the format. Uh, we're going to do <clears throat> Larry Sharon and Bob Barrazzato are going to be doing a presentation uh, that will talk and highlight some of the key aspects of um, mitigation as it relates to airflow. And then we're going to follow with questions and answers and a high level overview of the program itself. Um, we're asking that please uh, mute your phones and that you use a chat feature to submit your questions. And you can do this at any time. Uh, Stacy and Larry will be, will, all, will be looking at those. And uh, so if you have a question of somebody, uh, they'll try to answer it as we go along. Um, <clears throat> so um, the program details, just a second here. I'm not used to doing this with the phone. Uh, first of all, I want to I want to introduce um, and again Larry Schoen, who who is um, who is a fellow with Ashray, and we're very fortunate to have Larry join us because he actually is a, an absolute national expert in in this whole area of uh, of um, airflow and also just basic uh, environmental situations within manufacturing and other another large facilities. Uh, Bob Barzato is our lead engineer with RMI. He's been involved with us for almost a decade and providing uh, hundreds and hundreds of, 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 of programs uh, to manufacturers to help them with energy efficiency. Um, <clears throat> so today, basically, what's going to happen is you're going to hear from Larry and Bob, and they're going to kind of give you the key points of looking at uh, issues as it affects air ventilation and COVID. And following that, you'll get a chance to answer, ask questions, as I said before. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, so with that, uh, Larry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I guess I turn it over to you at this point uh, to um, to talk to the group about this uh, this amazing program that we have. Thanks, Larry. Sure. Um, so, uh, when we look at the what, what's happened in some of the very early outbreaks even before this was declared a pandemic. Uh, there was an opportunity to study, um, a lot of these happened in China because uh, that is where the virus started. And also, um, Frank, quite frankly, they have a lot of manpower and the woman power to uh, throw at a problem. And they had very little uh, disease transmission at the time. So um, there were a couple of, several outbreaks that were studied and without going into the details of each one, I've pulled out some of these commonalities that we found in what created the high-risk situations where very often a single infected person infected multiple people in a, in a space. So the commonalities uh, are bulleted here. Uh, almost no ventilation in, in many of these, and, and either absent air filtration or very poor air filtration. So one of them, for instance, had washable screen as a as a filter as opposed to true air filtration. Uh, very little exchange with uh, the outdoor air to dilute any kind of contaminants and people packed in a small space. Um, and even some of the industrial uh, outbreaks that we saw in the U.S. meat packing. Um, there were some of those commonalities. People probably working close to each other. The fourth bullet. Um, loud talking, yelling perhaps over the sound of machinery. That's something we want to try to avoid in any kind of environment. So we encourage electronic communication and uh, hand signals if necessary. Um, and the significant exposure time, this is something hard to avoid in a workplace. Of course, most uh, many, many operations take longer than 60 to 100 minutes, but uh, uh, there, have, there has been spread, of course, in much shorter period of time and, and sharing these small spaces. So that's what you can do sort of in a behavioral level. Take a, take a look on the, on the next slide, but the filtration and, and air, uh, air dilution are things you actually can affect. So that's what you find in the oval on the left side of this slide. But this slide gives you uh, in a 
graphical and verbal format, what you've probably all heard in, 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 the, in the news media and anything you might have studied. The short range separation, the short range in the top left of the slides, is, you know, less than six foot. Six foot is kind of an arbitrary number because uh, you, you can actually have spread at 10 feet. And uh, this, this six feet came from a, a rounding of two meters, which actually rounds to seven feet, uh, because one meter was found to be the range at which a lot of the larger droplets fall. Six feet is very arbitrary. So um, the thing is not to have close contact and wear a mask. That's the behavioral level. We really cannot affect that with an HVAC system, regardless uh, of what anybody's claiming about uh, good ventilation, filtration, adding adding substances to the air. There is really not good evidence that uh, any of that can affect the short range. But on the longer range, particularly when people are in the same room, we do not want to have tightly enclosed spaces with bad air filtration. So therefore, we say it in the positive, dilute, um, and, and dilute air with outdoor air. That is, by the way, presumed not to be heavily contaminated. This is, even though people are using the term shelter in place, this is not a shelter in place situation. Shelter in place is when you have an air contaminant outside. We want to expose our indoor spaces as much as possible to the out of doors because those are presumed to be cleaner. Um, so that's the HVAC part. In the box in the middle of the, of the slide, it shows you graphically these, these very large dots from the person in the middle settling to the ground and not reaching the adjacent person. The person on the left, however, blowing a cloud of uh, respiratory aerosols, quite frankly, um, directly at this other person when we want to try to avoid that. Um, the person, person farther away to the right is the one that we believe we can protect to some extent with the HVAC system uh, interventions. And then in the, in the middle where you see these two hands in the fomite route label, uh, that's again something that we generally cannot affect with ventilation. And this is more of a behavioral and surface cleaning issue that you've heard so much about. In the bottom and the fine print, I ask you not to be too worried about exact size of particle, because depending on which expert you ask, you'll find a different uh, size demarcation between the fine aerosols that remain aerosolized and the larger droplets that settle to surface. So don't get too hung up on that, understanding the principle that small can travel farther and large drops to the ground. And the fact that the small, even though they're quite small, as you see on, on the next slide, I think it's the next one, uh, even though they're quite small, these uh, red particles in particular compared to a human hair, fine beach sand, they can, we can influence those even with air filtration. Even though the virus itself is quite small, 0.1 microns. So the red dot here is two and a half microns or smaller. Even though the virus itself is 1 25th of that, it never travels alone. It travels in the air as part of a mucus and salt uh, droplet, uh, frankly, because it's come from a person, it's come from the lungs. It's not traveling on its own, and we do have the ability to impact those particles with ordinary air filtration. You've probably heard MERV-13 uh, mentioned a lot, but even filters down to the MERV-8 level do do something in the particle size of interest. And the more you circulate that air through the filter, the, the you know, it repeatedly can do the particulate removal. So even if an infected person is in a room, with other people who might be exposed, just by filtering that air within, within the room, we are reducing the risk to some extent. So that's, uh, keep that red size particle in, in, in mind. That's the 2.5 micron. And I, let's take a look at the next slide now, uh, which gets into the details of what we actually can do in the HVAC. Um, uh, and, and what's underlined in the first bullet is there are energy saving strategies which are great to do when we're not in the midst of a pandemic 
And the, one of those strategies is to reduce the amount of outdoor air. So we're not uh, conditioning more of it than we need to. Now, in this beautiful weather we're having at this time of year, this is less of an issue. But as we get into those uh, hot, humid days of summer, outside air that you bring in does require um, cooling and dehumidification. And so generally, when we're not in the midst of a pandemic, we want to reduce that to save energy. But in the midst of a pandemic, uh, most people are recommending disable that for the moment. We want to remember to re-enable it when we get out of this pandemic. But for the moment, as much outdoor air as, as possible. Here you see the MERV 13 uh, or higher. But as I said, even lower will do something. So if you have an old air handling system that might have only a one inch filter rack and you can't get a MERV 13, MERV 11, MERV, even MERV 8 or 9, do it. It improve the filtration. And the underlying language in the third bullet, if you put in a higher level of filtration and you have gaps around the edge, you are defeating your purpose. So seal the edges of those filters, either with a tight fitting of cardboard to metal surface, or in some cases, a piece of spring metal, or even, even weather stripping, foam weather stripping will do a good job. Of course, keep the systems running. If the system's not running, it can have the best filters. It can have great introduction of outdoor air, but if the system's turned off, that's no good. So that means um, doing things like looking at a thermostat, making sure it's set to fan on position. It means um, in, in systems that are shared zones, like maybe a VAV system, um, make sure you don't have dampers that are shutting off air to any particular area. Now on those portable room air cleaners, as I said, even if you have a space that you can't ventilate with outdoor air, the use of portable room air cleaners with HEPA filters can reduce the particulate load. Um, in a central air handler, we don't recommend a HEPA filter because they have high pressure drops. You can do almost as 90, well, the, the difference is 95 versus 99.7%. You can do almost the same job in a central air handle uh, with, a, with a good MERV filter. But on these standalone filters, they're already rated with a fan that can push the air through a HEPA filter. So that's why I have the HEPA listed here. And they can do a good job. Truly advanced measures that I, I would probably not recommend in most industrial or manufacturing facilities, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation. We might use that in a public area, um, possibly uh, a showroom, but really this is more intended for places like a transportation waiting area or a hospital cafeteria and so on. So don't turn systems off, boy, at the beginning when people were starting to hear shelter in place and does that mean I should turn my air conditioning off? No. Um, if you have a substandard ventilation system that has no outside air and no filtration, then perhaps. But any kind of decent HVAC system that has outdoor air and filtration, you want to run it with a couple of exceptions. If you did have uh, an, a, you know, an, an exposure to infection, then perhaps you want to clean the system before you turn it back on. I was just talking to a New York City teacher uh, yesterday. And uh, he said, although the schools are open, when they do have an infection, they close the school for a week in, that, in that, that particular school. So you might have a situation like that where you want to disinfect. And we don't usually have this major outdoor contamination, the, the, the last sub-bullet, uh, that really applies more to international locations. Uh, please, please stay away from anything that is either listed as an ozone generator or that hasn't been certified to reduce, to not re re release ozone. And I, I know there's a lot of heavy marketing of electronic air cleaners and uh, uh, introducing hydrogen peroxide and anything that says, um, that says ions or plasma. There's a lot of marketing of that. I can't say definitively they don't work. It's hard to prove a negative, but they do need to be proven 
that they actually do some good, I would not substitute those for good filtration by mechanical means and, uh, and, and good introduction of that good air. So I think we're going to turn it back to Mike now, and he's going to tell us, uh, uh, well, okay, after I do my summary, <laughs> we'll turn it back to Mike, and he'll tell you more about how the program can work uh, to help you accomplish some of these summary bullets here. So good, good, good HVAC system. What you know, I need to determine it's a good HVAC system, especially if it's aged. Um, outdoor air dampers have to be open. You can have something there if it's been closed for one reason or another. It's doing you no good. If you haven't checked it in a while, um, if you haven't measured it, uh, and and if you have the means to increase it, that's a that's a good good action. Uh, the filtration, I've mentioned that multiple times. And, uh, and keeping the system running, it, it, you know, even while cleaning people or, or, or maintenance staff are in there, maybe the whole um, operation is not going, but as long as there's occupancy, we want to keep the systems running. Airflow to each room is, is, is critical. I have seen fire dampers that close. I've seen dampers that close, ducts that collapse, uh, ducts that get disconnected over the years. and um, Advanced techniques, uh, probably rarely to be used. And now we'll turn it back to Mike and he'll tell you more about the program and how that can work for you on the next slide. Larry, thank you very much. Um, I'm just learning the technology of doing this by phone. So uh, thank you. So uh, bear with me. So, so um, Stacy, I think we want to get to the next slide now. Um, we do. I'm on, I'm on it. Right, right. Hey, Larry, before we get to the slide, I, I have a question for you, for the audience. When you, as you, if you go into, and I know this is hard to answer, but when you go into a facility, say a mid-sized facility, if you were to do the, do the kind of assessment that you're talking about, how long approximately might that take for you to walk through and, and with, with the folks? Is that a, a half a day, a whole day or? Uh, that, that is hard to answer because of, because of the size of the facility. facility. I mean, um, to, to do the, to scratch the surface, the first visit on a small facility could be an hour or two. On a larger facility with lots of air handling systems and lots of individual spaces, uh, it could be, be different. Much longer. It could be a day. It could be yeah. Long. And it depends on how much information okay. we start with that the facility can provide. Okay. Mike, okay. we do have a question right. from. Mike, do you see the question posed for Larry from Susan? No, why don't you read it? Sure. She says, why specifically do you say is UVGI considered advanced and not for manufacturing? Isn't it effective, less maintenance than filters, and more energy efficient than bringing in outdoor air? All right. So, so there are two kinds of ultraviolet that are often considered <laughs> in, in systems. One is induct. Uh, or in in the air handling system, and those are those are very effective for keeping coils clean and saving energy in that way. In order to do any disinfection uh, in the airstream, they have to have a long enough residence time uh, and a high enough intensity to actually do some to do an effective kill rate. Um, they are expensive to install. They do have an operating cost, both in electricity to run the lamps and also to re replace the lamps, which depending, I think is about uh, 10,000 hours. Um, do they require less maintenance? Um, I mean, you don't have to change them as frequently as filters. Um, but uh, uh, they do still require some maintenance to make sure the lamps stay clean and the lamps stay closed, like they said. The other type is upper room UVGI. And, and that's the one that I said would really be a specialized application. Um, so the other downside of UV, even if you disinfect all the air at the air handler, it's still only as good as the air distribution of that air handler. So all those other things I mentioned about uh, making sure it's running, making sure air actually gets to each room uh, is, is very important. So I, I don't think, you know, if, if somebody's really, um, 
I think that's all I'll say about it. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what could be the next step. Uh, but before I get to that, I just want to emphasize how we got to how we got where we are today. Um, I was served on the uh, Governor Hogan last spring, put together a, a manufacturing COVID-19 um, task force to identify things that manufacturers need to be doing in order to mitigate um uh, the spread of COVID inside facilities, and one of the one of the key uh, recommendations that was air airflow or air ventilation systems, and that's how this came about. It was uh, something that the governor's office endorsed. Um, RMI had been working with the Maryland Energy Administration for a number of years on various programs in energy efficiency, so we approached them and talked about the need to promote this idea of having the, the knowledge about ventilation systems and what could be done to mitigate uh, problems. And so the Maryland Energy Administration and RMI teamed up to, to bring you, uh, Larry and Bob and our other engineers, to do not just mitigation assistance as it relates to airflow, but in some cases, energy efficiency. Um, so this is called the Manufacturing Disruption Mitigation Mitigation Assistant Program. Stacy, next slide. Okay, hey, so- Mike, Mike, I'm sorry, yeah. can I interrupt you? We have another question yeah. from, from Frank who said, oh. Um, big ass fans have a UV system where their fans have airflow up and through the UV system, hit the ceiling and return. Is this helpful or useful? Uh, I, I, I've, I've seen that product. Um, in, in theory, it sounds like it could do something, um, but I, I, I'm not aware of, uh, I, I haven't studied into any independent reviews of how effective they are in actually reducing the viral load. In the room. So it's plausible. It certainly makes sense. Um, let me, let me add one other thing, which is if you have, if you already have so, so the, the, the devices, whether it's a standalone recirculating filter system, like a room air cleaner or a UV in a room, their effectiveness is highest when you already have low air change rates. Once you start to get higher air change rates, you already have a lower viral load, so the relative effectiveness of these add-ons goes on. So I guess I'm just trying to drive home the point again. Cover the basics first before you move to the ancillary add-ons. Yeah, Larry, one of the things I've learned um, and working with you and with Bob, too, is that this approach that we're talking about is is – is probably what I'd say highly customizable to the specific factory, that every situation is gonna be different, which brings us to the point where we are right now. We have a program that will allow <clears throat> Larry and his team and Bob and others to go out to companies to do an assessment, to do an on-site assessment, to help you understand the things that, that are kind of working right and not working so right. And they'll put together a report that you can have to, so that you can decide whether or not you want to continue to upgrade upgrade systems to make the, the to make the um, the facility safer. So in order to qualify for this, okay, you have to be a manufacturing company in Maryland. And what you see up here is a list of the NAICS codes that represent the various, uh, you know, who are manufacturers. A lot of times there's confusion about who's a manufacturer. Uh, we go by NAICS code. So if you're not in one of these, these areas, uh, you most likely will not qualify for the program. Next slide. Um, so there's on the RMI website, correct, Stacy. We have a form. So if you're interested in having us come out to to do this assessment, and there's no cost for this assessment, um, just go onto the RMI website and submit your your interest form. Uh, we're going to confirm your eligibility. And then again, we'll connect with Larry and Bob and Nandini uh, to do an on-site assessment by uh, the engineering team. And then 
for those, and this, this is one thing that's important to, ex, to explain. For those companies that are not in the Pepco or Delmarva service area, so the state, and you'll kind of know it's like it's on your electric bill, whether if you're in a Delmarva or Pepco service area, um, that's a different service than you, if you're in an, another area of the state. So what we'll do is they will, Larry and his team, will write up kind of like a prescription, like a doctor does, and says, here's what we saw. It's a report. Here's what we saw. Here are the things that we think that, that you need to attend to. Uh, the Maryland um, Energy Administration uh, is available to work with companies to see if they would qualify, if they need to do upgrades in particular, uh, qualify for some of the loan programs uh, and grant programs that they have with them. Is this mine or is this Larry's? I, I think on for, for our agenda, I think I, I pick up for a couple of slides here, Mike. Yeah, yeah, this is you, Larry. All right, so, um, so uh, you know, the reason I answered um, the question about the amount of time is because it sure depends on the size of the facility. So, you know, even though I'm an HVAC person, and one of the first things I need to do is to visualize the facility. How is it divided up? Where are the openings to the outside? So that's a general facility layout. Then we want to gain an understanding of how air is moving within the facility. So that's uh, the next bullet, the li just listing what is there. Um, single zone system, of course, handles one area. Multi zone systems could be uh, supplying air to multiple places, and there may be some type of zone control that varies that air either on a, 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 a control can be on off cycling or it can be continuously modulated and then there's the outdoor air situation is it a makeup air system where it's constant and running in conjunction with exhaust is it part of a mixed air ventilation recirculating some and project, injecting in some outdoor air does it have an economizer which in this gorgeous weather right now would pull in 100% outside air, at least when, the, when we break above 55 degrees, perhaps. And then looking at the filtration that's available and uh, uh, general maintenance maintenance condition, is the system still maintainable? Um, and then uh, is there any kind of uh, energy recovery, heat recovery? That's a way um, to get the dilution benefit of outdoor air without the energy penalty. So there's a win-win a both for ventilation and for energy. Next slide, Stacy. And, and so the details of the controls are those uh, thermostat locations and capabilities. I was working with some one facility where um, everything was localized. And so whether it's outdoor air or temperature set points, everything had to be a person walking up to a control. Um, of course, more modern modern systems and more capable systems have a, a building management system, BMS or EMS, energy management, and ability to control that remotely. So we have a vast difference of how those controls are set up and the, and the level of automated scheduling that they have. And then on the um, on the distribution side, as I said, different ways to, to get air to different spaces. And, and I mentioned earlier about measuring air that is coming in from the out of doors and going to different places, whether it's a exhaust and makeup system for a dedicated process or whether it's a, a code required ventilation system, it's important to know uh, and measure that. Ashray now recommends measuring amounts of outdoor air at least every five years. So that's not a legal requirement. That's an ASHRAE recommendation and it's standard. Uh, but it's, it's a good idea, particularly in these times. And so that gets into the larger issue of retro commissioning. Um, has the system, has the you know, controls have a something we engineers put on the drawings about how they're supposed to work, but has anybody checked it recently to see that it's 
really doing what you expect it to be doing. Next slide, please. please. Um, and then, and then part of this assessment, you, you know, I, it, here's, here's a phrase I like to use about people. Uh, people's noses, the olfactory system, as the, 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 the uh, physiologist would call it, is a mobile chemoreceptor, mobile <laughs> sensor for chemicals. So we listen to people and what they say about odors and what they say about complaints. We we can we are real time we're real time sensors and spacers, and, uh, and so we use that as a starting off point sometimes for identifying a problem whether it's with uh, indoor air quality or with energy. And of course, energy indoor air quality is there. There are certain things that can be measured, uh, like PM two point five and volatile organics, um, but energy is really easy. Well, I shouldn't say really easy, but it's something we can measure with a great degree of precision. It's easy if the meter is in there. It's not always easy to put the meter in. So monitoring what is already being measured is a very important, uh, important and uh, quantifiable thing. And then how easily can you change set points and schedule? I mentioned full automation as opposed to uh, something that's more manual. So there sometimes is a balance in the, in, under this pitfall list of uh, certain actions like pulling in more outdoor air and disabling demand controlled ventilation, as I mentioned, can have an energy penalty, but those can be managed and mitigated. And the ERV and HRV, energy heat recovery that we mentioned, is one of the ways to do that, to try to get uh, both covered. And of course, we say more outdoor air, but systems have practical limitations, both for the amount of air that they can pull and the amount that they can, can, can condition that outdoor air. So these are all these are all um, interventions that we can get a better handle on after doing an assessment of the facility. So next slide, Stacy. And I think we're back to you, Mike. For the For the deliverables. Okay. Uh, yep. Took me a while. Okay. Uh, let me clarify something that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> this program is available statewide to manufacturers across the state. Um, for those manufacturers that are in the Pepco service area or Delmarva service area, um, we have grant money to do a more in depth. Uh, energy um, assessment, energy efficiency assessment. So if you're in those areas, it, which is Montgomery County, Prince George's County, and parts of the Eastern Shore, um, when you talk to us, let us know whether or not you're in either the Pepco or Delmarva service area, because we can offer more services for you. <clears throat> so, um, I'm sorry. So, so what you get from Larry is a prioritized list of equipment replacements and enhancements and operational and maintenance changes that can improve overall air handling to help mitigate the risk of disruption of COVID-19. And again, this is, this is Larry and others coming out to your site, doing the assessment, writing you up a report, and making recommendations. Uh, for those that are in the PEPCO service area or the Delmarva area, we can also do a more in-depth energy assessment. And there is no cost for that energy assessment. So uh, so if if you're part of this call and you're in that one of those service areas, uh, we definitely want to hear from you. Stacy, is there another slide? Okay, so if you got any more questions, submit them to um, on the chat feature. <clears throat> I'm not sure that we do have any more. Can you see any more, Stacy? Yeah, someone is asking, um, can a design build firm that has evaluated a client space already work with RMI to receive funds for the client? Is there any synergy? The 
the the funds that we have let's let's are we ta- or if we're just talking about Larry going out and doing the assessment <clears throat> we can do that they would have to talk to the Maryland Energy Administration or we can help with that to see what fund what funding might be available but typically if somebody has already started uh, I'm sorry if somebody has already started an implementation of an energy efficiency uh, strategy, uh, I don't think you can get the funds for it. You have to request the funds usually before implementation has occurred. But Larry, were you going to say something? Yeah, yeah, I have a follow up yeah. question on that. So, so does the facility itself have to make the request, or can a contractor make it on behalf of the facility? Well, a contractor can make it. A, a contractor can make it. If we're talking a request to us or to MEA, who you talk, either uh, one, they can they can make it. So, so I'm trying to think yeah. about. I'm trying to envision. Let's say uh, a facility contracts out their maintenance, and the contractor has the list of equipment and characterization of all this stuff. Um, that could that could give us a, a head start, I would think, in, in doing the facility assessment. And, uh, as long as it's coming from a manufacturing company um yes yes if i understand the question correctly we can we can work with contractors too does that help i mean it sounds like you got to get the facility on board <laughs> it can't just be an independent request from the contract <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's best if anybody's interested, okay, again, go to the, the RMI website and submit submit your name, and we're going to follow up with you um, so that we can determine what's the best course of action. Uh, I will say this. Uh, we have quite a few people that are interested in this, and we're still waiting for some final approval from MEA. Uh, so it may be another week or so before we can actually get out to their places. All right. Well, listen. If there are if, uh, one last shot, any more, any other questions? Uh, you can see Stacy's going to send out. And Stacy, thanks for helping me um, on this. Uh, she's going to si- send out the slide deck, so you'll have a copy of the, or link to the slide deck. Uh, and again, and the, and the interest form. So if you're interested in having Larry and his team or other engineers come out to visit with you, uh, fill out that form and send it over to us. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And Larry, uh, another great presentation. Thank you so much. And again, Stacy, uh, thank you for helping me uh, while we were trying to navigate this with a phone, which was my first time in doing this. So uh, with that, I think we're going to we'll end the program. And thank you very much. Bye, Larry. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.